Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Malcolm Graham, and I chair the City of Charlotte's uh, Economic Development Committee meeting. would like to take this opportunity to welcome each and every one of you uh, to the August 1st, uh, 2022 meeting. Uh, we have a PAC agenda with three items, uh, Charlotte Business Inclusion Disparity Study, the Higher Charlotte Update, as well as an OPERA Update. And so we're going to get right to it by first introducing all the council members who are visiting with us virtually, our committee members. I think we got a full house, which is good. So I will turn it over to for introduction, starting with uh, the vice chairman. Uh, Ed Driggs, committee member and vice chair. Good afternoon, Dimple Ajmira, committee member. Victoria Watlington, District 3, committee member. Okay, so we'll introduce those who are in the room with me at the Government Center, uh, room 280. Um, if you can formally introduce yourself so we all can know who's attending this committee meeting. Robin Stewart, leader on loan, corridors of opportunity. Todd DeLong, economic development. Holly Eskridge, economic development. Christina Thigpen, economic development. Tracy Dodson, city manager's office and economic development. Donata Jackson, office of constituent services. Stephen Coker, Charlotte Business Inclusion Program. Phil Rieger, General Services. Thomas Powers, City Attorney's Office. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We do have some special guests with us as well. At, at some point, they'll introduce themselves during the topic of discussion. Um, but at this point, I'll turn it over to our uh, Economic Development Director, Tracy Dotson, to, to provide an overview of the agenda and to get to action step one. Thank you, Council Member Graham. Um, we have a, our first item is um, the disparity study, which we spent quite a bit of time on last month. Um, wanted to bring this back uh, to you all today for a vote or recommendation, I would say. Um, then followed by that, we have an update on Hire Charlotte. And I don't know if you would remember, but Hire Charlotte, when we did it and we um, talked about the first round of ARPA dollars, we said that the work that came out of Hire Charlotte should inform the second round of ARPA spending from our side. And so we want to start that discussion just from what were the recommendations and where do we stand with certain initiatives. And we've got a good update on that. And then the third item is an overall ARPA update on our first round and where we stand with all of the um, projects that we had going on with that. Thank you, Ms. Dotson. And with that, we'll go to agenda item number one, Charlotte Business Inclusion Disparity Study. Uh, Ms. Dotson. Do you want to kick it back over to, to Phil? And sure. Steve? Good afternoon, um, Chairman Graham, uh, members of the committee, Phil Rieger with General Services. Uh, I've got Steve Coker here, uh, our director of CBI. Um, Thomas Powers is here with the city attorney's office, and we have our uh, consultant, um, Colette Holt, with Colette Holt and Associates. She's our uh, subject matter expert. Uh, she's here today to answer any questions that there might be remaining. Uh, but I'm not going to stand in the way. Let me turn it over to Steve, and uh, we'll get to it. Again, Stephen Coker, for the record. Program Manager for Charlotte Business Inclusion. Uh, just again, as a recap, this is uh, part two of our presentation to committee. Uh, on June 22nd, we didn't have uh, the quorum needed to refer this to full council. That's, so that's our purpose today. Uh, what I want to do really briefly is to give you some differences of the 2017 uh, disparity study and the 2022 disparity study, uh, and then give you uh, the revised uh, schedule and then open up the floor for any questions that the committee might have for Colette. And then, of course, we'd like uh, your referral to full council uh, in September. Um, <clears throat> as far as the major differences, uh, the first is the aspirational goal goes from 13 uh, for 20.9% in 2017 to 13.1%. Uh, the Charlotte Statistical Area, or CSA, expands from 13 counties uh, where it is now to the full 100 counties 
in the state of North Carolina as well as York County in South Carolina. And then uh, we will set goals on SBEs only when there are no available M's, minorities, or women business enterprises. Any questions on any of that? Okay. Now, relative to the schedule, and this is our revised schedule, of course, we're meeting here today. Uh, if we get the referral on September 12th, uh, the disparity study consultant, Colette Holt, will present to the full city council. On September 26th, uh, the disparity study then would, uh, we would ask you to adopt it. And then in the fall, uh, we would present the disparity study to our CBIAC, or Charlotte Business Inclusion Advisory Committee. Uh, and then also in the fall, the staff, along with CBIAC and ED Council Committee, will review and recommend changes to the policy and procedures. Uh, and then in the fall, the staff will do the work to craft the policy changes and in anticipation of the 2023 implementation. And then in the spring 2023, staff to implement a communications and marketing plan for the 2022 disparity study. Uh, there are no questions. I'm gonna turn it back over to the chair. Uh, thank you very much for, for the, the brief presentation. I just want to uh, inform uh, and thank uh, the committee. I was not here at the last meeting when this was presented. Uh, in the interim, however, I was able to meet with um, the city attorney's office, um, Attorney Powell's, as well as um, the director of the program, uh, as well as um, with our vice chairman who, who chaired that meeting and uh, shared some of his concerns. Uh, I don't have any questions. I'm, I'm ready to move the, um, the document forward to the full council. So I will pause and take any questions if there's any from, from the committee. Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Director, recognize. Thank you, sir. As you know from our conversation, uh, I fully support the goals of CBI and I appreciate the, all the work that goes into it. I have reached a point though, where I, I think that uh, our legal basis is very aggressive on this one. We do have a memo from uh, our legal staff saying that they think it is defensible, uh, which in my mind is not identical with being completely in line with the spirit of the laws that apply here. Uh, I also have a concern that as we go to the full state, uh, we're going to end up paying out a lot to people who aren't in Charlotte. Uh, we're going to be including minority businesses statewide to the extent of about 70 percent of our contracting. And I would prefer for us to have a program that is more targeted at businesses who are actually located here. So on that basis, I will not be able to support this. I just wanted to explain that. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Council Member Drakes. Mr. Graham. Uh, Ms. Ashmere, you recognize? Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And a couple of questions. So. I'm on board with this 2022 disparity study and would like for us to move forward. Uh, though I have questions to Mr. Drake's point here about providing opportunities and prioritizing uh, vendors that are local here in Charlotte. Uh, is that something that can be done as part of our effort here? And that, that question is for staff from the uh, team. Thank you for the question, um, Mr. Powell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Ashmira, um, the state of North Carolina does not provide authorization to local governments to enact a local preference for businesses uh, within our community over those in the state or within the uh, nation as a whole. Uh, I will say, and, and I'm looking at Steve to this, uh, our program is based on those that register uh, and are a part of our CBI program. So those businesses that do register would be counting towards any goals that is set by the city council. Um, so 
If you have a business in Asheville that could be a part of our program but does not register, they would not be counted. So if our marketplace happens to have a lot of registrations of local businesses, they would be counted towards the goal. But to Mr. Driggs's point, it would be open to anyone within the state to register uh, here in the city of Charlotte. So we can make a big pitch locally to encourage local registration? I, I will defer to Mr. Uh, Coker, who is actually handling those operations. But legally, yes, but he, he'll be able to talk about the communications plan. Mr. Coker? No, I think uh, Tom has uh, hit the nail on the head. Uh, we could, you know, have a, a consideration via our registration process. Uh, and that we do uh, require a local address. Uh, so, yes. Uh, we will look at the firms that are in uh, local in terms of uh, who we would like to participate on our city contracts. But let, me, let me just make sure I clarify, just for all intents and purposes. While the communication strategy will be, again, putting out emails uh, in the newspaper and other t uh, tweets locally here, uh, we are not preventing anyone in the state from registering. So I just want to make sure I make that clarification uh, for purposes of the record as well. Yeah, I, I think our local voices will be heard locally, yes. uh, and we can tell our local minority and small women um, business owners that uh, uh, registration is strongly encouraged. Yes. Councilmember Ashmer, additional questions? Yeah, so what I hear, what I hear uh, are, uh, Mr. Power says that we cannot limit who registers with the city of Charlotte uh, so any business that's outside of the city of Charlotte can register. However, we can make a big push for local businesses to register, and hopefully that will help us uh, with you know, local businesses, and ultimately those will benefit from some of the city contracts and opportunities. Is that correct? That would be a good summation. Um, Mr. Coker, okay. Mr. Coker right. can actually talk about uh, in, under your current 2017 program, you have a 13-county action radius. But um, and again, I'm asking uh, Steve, how many uh, percentage-wise, how many businesses are outside of Mecklenburg County, to your knowledge? Outside of Mecklenburg, 70% uh, of the businesses make up uh, what this study comprises of. Uh, but for 20, 2017, do you know how many businesses are currently registered outside of Mecklenburg County for a 13-county radius? I don't know the actual number outside, uh, but uh, the good, the majority are right here in Charlotte uh, because we do require a local address. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eshamira. Uh, any additional questions from the committee members? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I understood uh, what uh, the gentleman just said. So are we saying then that uh, a substantial majority, uh, 90 some percent, of our uh, uh, registrations are local, and we only had like seven percent in a thirteen in the other thirteen counties in North Carolina. Is that what I heard, Mr. Phipps? What you heard is we have a requirement that, in order to be registered as a minority or woman-owned business in the, for the city of Charlotte, you have to have a local business presence which means an address. And so all of those businesses that are in, uh, that are registered as minority and women-owned businesses are local by virtue of the fact that they have a local address. And, 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 and could you state again, I mean, what percentage of our uh, applications are local compared to outside of the area? That I, I don't know if I'm hearing your question. You're saying what percentage are local? Right. Mr. Fitz. Right now, I, mean, I guess you said, I mean, I thought I heard you say that currently we have a 13 county uh, coverage, but we're going to 100 counties. Is that right? That's correct. Mr. Phipps, this is Phil Rieger. Um, currently, today, as it stands under the 2017 study and policy, all of our vendors. Uh, have a local presence within the 13 county geography. We will be moving to 100 counties, uh, but as was said earlier, we can make sure to, to enhance our efforts locally to make it known that we want our minority and women businesses to register with us. 
Um, the, the program already does a lot to encourage registration. You can't force people to register, but we certainly encourage it, and we will double down on those efforts to make sure that our local folks know uh, that it is advantageous for uh, them to be a part of our program. Thank you. Okay, um, so um, if there's no additional questions, uh, I'd like to um, get a motion from the committee to move the report forward to the city council. Can I get a motion? So, so moved to move second. the 2022 disparity study to full council. It's been properly moved by Councilmember Ajmer, second by Councilmember Wallington. All those in favor, um, raise your hand so I can see them. That's one, two, three. Councilmember Fitz, your hand's up. I don't see it. Is yeah, it my hand's hand. up. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right, so that's four. All those against? Uh, Mr. Dregs, um, by his uh, earlier comment, so... That motion moves forward to the City Council for consideration. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Thank the second agenda item is Higher Charlotte Update. Um, Ms. Dotson. Yes, yeah, so if you remember, we started Higher about a year ago, and it was really to try to bring everybody in the ecosystem um, around workforce development, job creation together. Christina uh, Thigpen in our office ran a lot of that work. So I'll turn it over to Christina and let you introduce our guest as well. Thanks, Tracy. I'd like to acknowledge some of our guests today. We have Austin Halbert, <coughs> excuse me, with the Radius Group, who will be doing a deeper dive on the work he's been doing with the Pathways pilot um, shortly. We also have Blair Stanford with CELC on virtually. And then in person, we have Danielle Frazier and Anna London with Charlotte Works, who have been working closely with us since we launched the framework on next steps and how to prioritize our recommendations. Next slide, please. So just to level set, I think we were back here in April presenting the actual framework to you all. Our overall overarching goal for Hire Charlotte is to immediately increase Charlotte Mecklenburg's employment ecosystem's impact on creating and filling jobs that drive economic prosperity for all. And so how are we going to do this? This framework is really the North Star for how our employment ecosystem can work more efficiently, collaborative, and be more connected than ever to get to that North Star, that desired effective employment ecosystem. Then, of course, just as a reminder, the timing of this is perfect as we look at not only ARBA funding, but other potential funding sources to move this work forward. Next slide, please. And then this is just an illustration by what we mean when it comes to employment ecosystem. It's all about connecting the job seekers with employers, and then all of the great stakeholders that make up the employment ecosystem in the center where we have our North Star, which is fulfilling the vision of our strategic employment framework. Next slide, please. And then this slide should probably be familiar to you as well. As Tracy mentioned, we've been working for over a year. We did a lot of work with a consultant, SIR, on building these um, building blocks to get to the framework. So every step of the way, we created deliverables so we could have sound research upon which to build this framework. And we have deliverables for all 12 steps on our Hire Charlotte website. And what's been great about this is a lot of our partner organizations within the ecosystem have found this research really helpful. And as we work on ongoing efforts, we continue to look for this as resources to drive the employment ecosystem forward. Next slide, please. Next slide. So this was the framework that we introduced you to in April. Again, we came up with some core values to really base our vision that Charlotte's employment ecosystem is a collaborative, agile, and results-oriented network that accelerates employer growth and upward mobility for all. And we came up with three strategic goals to get us there, recognizing that employer participation is critical to drive this work forward. You'll also remember we recommended six implementation programs and Obviously, one is the one-stop portal that we'll spend some good time on today. 
hard skills and soft skills certification, um, scalable reskilling upward mobility programs, which is really training for the jobs of tomorrow, and then target industry recruitment, talent development action plans. And at the center of it all, it's that ongoing ecosystem network coordination and growth plan, which um, we're continuing to do. So what I'd like to do now, next slide please, is talk to you about what we're recommending as priorities from these recommendations that the steering committee came up with as part of our strategic employment framework. And I'd like to just thank this coalition that we've formed um, since we launched the framework, we've got great partners in the city, of course, the county, Charlotte Works, Goodwill, CELC, and they've just been a great sounding board as we've decided what we want to prioritize moving forward. Next slide, please. So I'd like to just spend a little time on what we've outlined as priorities based on those six implementation recommendations. And of course, the one-stop portal, Hire Charlotte Portal, is something that we've gotten great interest in across the ecosystem. We recognize there are multiple access points to making it difficult for job seekers and employers to know where or how to most effectively access resources and job openings. And so the timing of this is really important, too, because we can align with CELC's current pathway initiative that Austin will speak to a little bit later in the program. Another area of instance of focus is our targeted industry alignment and marketing. So we spent a lot of time as a steering committee and project management team building consensus around what are our target industries, including financial and professional services, technology, manufacturing, transportation, and healthcare. And so we want to create better awareness in terms of developing marketing materials so we can help create even more career opportunities within these industries. And then industry-specific skills alignment. This is really focusing on technical skills. And this work will seek to align the broad existing catalog of these services offered by our educational and workforce development partners. So this will really require a deep dive on what are the existing hard skills programs that exist? Are they leading to jobs? What works? How can we streamline this? And have all of this eventually live on the Hire Charlotte portal? And just, um, I know I touched on the top three, but some parallel efforts we've talked about recently with the coalition include additional consideration for essential or soft skills curriculum, working with Charlotte Works and Goodwill on that. And then our business recruitment team is going to really do some work around target industry recruitment, talent development action plans so we can be more intentional about reaching out to those companies that we know we've got the talent here that we continue to cultivate to make sure that their companies are successful in Charlotte. Next slide, please. I wanted to spend a little bit more time before Austin goes into it on my end in terms of expectations for this higher Charlotte portal that we've been spending so much time talking about. And this is really going to be a community-facing website and brand. And we want to make sure it's scalable. So we're going to be using a lot of the work from the Pathways pilot to inform this work. The job openings will be sure to be aligned with those targeted industries and occupations. And, and we also recognize that there needs to be a physical component to this work. So um, it will start with marketing materials at job seeker locations such as NC Works, Career Center, Goodwill Opportunity Campus, Urban League, and Livian. And then as the Hire Charlotte portal is built out and evolves, we just see ongoing integration with curriculums that could work at these physical locations. So more to come, but we want to make sure that this is accessible and it's meeting people where they are so that they can take advantage of this important resource. And it's really cool that the city has been able to support the Radius Pathways pilot. We, we took 75,000 out of our ARPA funding to build capacity with Radius so that they can continue this great work with the CELC and Bloomberg. And um, we have a representative that sits on the Radius Pilot Steering Committee as well. 
So we're all connected. We're all working together. We're all making sure that we're working smarter, not duplicating any efforts, and consistently informed. And then a big part of what we're doing with the coalition, too, over the next couple months is really determining what are the key content elements that will need to be on this portal. Um, a perfect example of an existing effort that we want to make sure is completely integrated is the Workforce Providers Council is working on launching a new website, and we're very much talking with them to make sure how does this fit into, you know, with the existing pilot and then eventually the higher Charlotte portal so we're all integrated together and that we're, again, continuing to work smarter and building upon the incredible work. And, of course, cataloging all the existing job boards for this, hard skills information. I mentioned this before. I know Anna and I in previous conversations have said people have requested this information for years. So we're really excited that through Hire Charlotte, we're going to be able to provide all of this access um, through this powerful por portal. Next slide, please. So again, Austin will talk to you a little bit more about the pilot in a moment, but I wanted to take this moment to give you an update on where we are with some of the ARPA funding to date and some of our proposed funding as we want to build out some of these initiatives through Higher Charlotte. So the one-stop portal, we propose funding for $1 million. Um, we've already put $75,000 to the pilot, and we would propose getting funding from the second tranche of ARPA funding for this. We've also talked about the importance of essential skills or soft skills curriculum and propose two million going toward that. Um, Goodwill and Charlotte Works are working on some proposals now for us to see what that looks like, but we would propose that we get funding for that in the second tranche as well. Hard skills is a big component of what we're trying to achieve with um, higher Charlotte, especially within the target industries that we've identified. So um, I've had some preliminary conversations with Charlotte Works about this. The work is just beginning. Right now we're requesting about $5 million for this piece and would request that as, again, part of the second tranche of ARPA. And then a couple of the um, strategies that I've touched on already that we have existing capacity within the first tranche of higher Charlotte include the target industry alignment and marketing. Um, we estimate about $100,000 going toward that, and we're beginning work on that this quarter, as well as target industry recruitment talent development action plans and making sure that we're doing some customized plans for each targeted industry. Christina, can I stop you right there for just sure. a second? Because I want to point out, <clears throat> when we did the first tranche of ARPA funding for economic development efforts, we said we wanted to continue things that we had seen be successful in CARES, but that the second tranche was really going to be based around what came out of higher because we knew then we weren't going to be duplicating efforts with other entities around town that we had really all come together and convene. And so this is the first you're seeing of dollars being put to some of it, but we felt like it was important for you to start seeing it now and understand how it all fits together. Thanks, Tracy. Next slide, please. So just want to touch on next steps. I had mentioned the smaller coalition that had just been formed. We meet monthly, and I'm excited to share that we've added the Queen City Collaborative to this group, which is the local initiative that really supports My Future NC, which is the state's initiative around working to close edu the educational attainment gap. So again, it's making sure all of these important players are aligned and communicating regularly so that we're working as efficiently together as possible. I also wanted to note that the city is leading the ecosystem network coordination for the next year. However, this coalition is going to be creating a longer term governance strategy. Um, I touched on some of the ARPA funding allocations that we're proposing on the last slide, but obviously that's a priority, especially with the phase one implementation items that we're working on. And then I can't stress enough, just continuing to align with the existing efforts. So many incredible efforts are going on. I think another example is I'm working with Sean Heath on the Housing and Job Summit, and we definitely want to make sure Hire Charlotte is a big part of that programming. And ongoing stakeholder engagement. So we were really excited to be able to present to you 
our latest um, priority recommendations and get some input from you today. We plan to meet with the county in later August. We're getting together the steering committee again in September. And so we were excited to have some of these meetings with city council and the county before going back to the steering committee and sharing our recommendations. So just staying in touch with all the components of the employment ecosystem is so important because this is a truly collaborative community initiative. What questions can I answer before I hand it over to Austin? Ms. Wallington. Thank you. I, beyond questions, I've got some feedback, but I will wait until I get the full presentation. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Phipps, I think. Nope. No, my hand is not up. Okay. All right, let's continue then. Okay. Well, I would love to hand it over now to Austin Halbert. He's the chairman of the Radius Group, and he's been working diligently on creating a pathways pilot for job seekers, and he can kind of share all the work he's doing, and then hopefully you'll be able to see the connection between that incredible work and how we can apply it and scale it this higher Charlotte portal. Austin? Thank you, Christina, and good afternoon to you all. Um, I'm Austin from Radius Group. We have been working with the CLC on this uh, Charlotte Workforce Pathway System project. Uh, since around 2020, uh, we had a planning grant that was funded last year from Bloomberg Philanthropies. And so what we'll share today is, is a bit of um, vision for how that work connects with, with higher Charlotte. Um, and can work towards a portal for job seekers to connect with training and employment opportunities. Uh, so just a bit of context, we are about half a year into a three-year project uh, to develop workforce systems and technologies to expand pathways to employment. And we've worked with the CLC here to really take an employer-first approach to understand what are the hiring needs that uh, Charlotte's major employers across sectors are seeing over the next few years and how can we better coordinate as an ecosystem uh, to prepare those who need opportunity the most for those jobs that are there. Um, so Bloomberg initially led the funding here with support from the CLC and most recently um, from Hire Charlotte. And what I'll share throughout this presentation is a bit of a vision for what we'll build out. Um, I'll note here that we're building really collaboratively with, with community inputs. And so we're just getting ready to start building out this portal over the next six months um, with inputs from the type of partners that Hire Charlotte is bringing together in these uh, smaller committee meetings. Um, but the vision is to create this digital workforce pathway system um, that starts with helping employers to identify their future workforce needs across priority occupations and have a space where they can grow their talent pipelines with local partners. Um, for training providers, it's a space for them to actually partner with employers on training talent to meet those needs and for students and job seekers, a space for them to match with qualified training and employment opportunities. So this really is looking to create a more coordinated, cohesive way to connect a lot of the existing efforts in the community uh, to create mobility for, for Charlotte's residents. What we'll speak about today, though, is uh, specifically the job seeker facing side of that. So an opportunity portal, which will be a space where anyone who's really looking to chart their future can come and, and identify those opportunities that are the best fit for them, whether they've been laid off or just looking for a better opportunity for them and their families. Um, we know that Charlotte's employers have really been asking to figure out how they can better connect across all of their job roles with those people who need work or would like to be trained for the employment opportunities that are that are coming down the road. And the system we've laid out is is built on research that says that talent matching systems uh, have the potential to net 72 million new jobs globally by 2025. And so what, what we've seen in our studies of, of regions where the workforce systems work really well for employers and and the public, um, they have very smart talent matching that leads to higher participation, reduced unemployment, and higher productivity in the labor force overall. And so what we're preparing to do now and, and really consulting frequently with the Hire Charlotte team around is develop a first version of this, which would be Charlotte Opportunity Portal um, that we'd build throughout the second half of this year, launch a pilot in the first quarter. 
of 2023. Um, this will connect students and job seekers with training and employment opportunities, specifically across higher opportunity occupations. And so out of the gate, we're not trying to necessarily be an indeed for, for Charlotte and post every job opportunity that exists, but really look at those sort of 25 highest opportunity occupations where we know there's a lot of demand for employers and a lot of potential for people to, to actually train for those jobs or, or land those roles and immediately get to a family sustaining wage. And so we're focused on what we call middle, middle skills jobs. Um, these are jobs that pay a living wage but require less than a four-year degree. And that's part of what we'll work towards launching in this pilot um, in 2023. So right now we're working with the CLC to um, aggregate sort of an analysis of hiring needs across these occupations. Um, planning to pilot this first with a subset of uh, the population uh, together with Workforce Providers Council, Charlotte Mecklenburg CTE, and Road to Hire, so we can have um, sort of a, a smaller subset of, of folks that go through this portal first. And once that's demonstrated successfully, we'll, we'll launch a public-facing uh, public version in the second quarter of 2023. And so, no, you can't digest everything that's on here at once. We're happy to, to make these materials available, um, but just a snapshot of the roadmap we're going through from now through the end of next year. Um, our approach is, as we mentioned out front, is really employer first. So it starts with compiling as much data as we can directly from employers on what their hiring needs are. Um, on June 9th, we launched a workforce planning project with Charlotte Executive Leadership Council, and we now have 13 uh, top employers across target industries who have agreed to actually have their HR team share data and forecast on what those needs will be. And so over the next few months, we'll be able to see directly from Bank of America, HRM, Duke Energy, Coke Consolidated, some of the top employers across sectors, um, exactly where, where we need to fill some gaps in, in employment, and that'll be used to inform job commitments that'll that'll be able to be posted on this portal. Um, we'll then work with community partners to build version one, uh, launch with a pilot group, as we said at the start of next year, and then work, work towards rolling out uh, version one for public job seekers and coordinate really closely with the Hire Charlotte team to make sure that that this portal folds into Hire Charlotte's broader vision for a portal that includes wraparound services um, and and includes all of the resources that uh, that the ecosystem needs. So final slide here is just a picture of, of the impact that we hope to create. Um, first, by expanding employers' hiring commitments to train and hire Charlotte talent locally. There's a lot of intention, a lot of momentum from the private sector to figure out how to prepare folks for the jobs that are going to be there. But the fragmentation in the ecosystem has made it really difficult for this, this to actually happen at scale. Um, and so Getting that right really opens the door uh, to scale up job placements and training enrollments for those quality jobs that we're going to see increase in demand over the next few years and to make sure that we can do that proactively and train up those folks who are facing opportunity gaps or who have the greatest need for for income and employment as we look towards um, sort of creating additional mobility uh, in the region. So that's quick lay of the land from, from us. Happy to answer any questions while we're online today, and we'll look forward to, to sort of updating you all on our progress as we build this out with, with the Hire Charlotte team. Thank you, Austin. I think we're done. We're done? for questions. All right, um, I'll, I'll take the first one. And first, let me thank everyone for uh, the quality of work that we've we've seen before us, um, and I know a lot of work has gone into it. I'm fully supportive of the, the portal concept, but I go back to what you said earlier, meeting people where they are, and, and some people just aren't computer savvy, don't have the ability to connect online. So could you reiterate once again um, how, how we um, um, approach and engage our less sophisticated citizens who may not have the resources, the capabilities, or the understanding to kind of navigate the the, net, the portal, but desperately in the need of a job. Yeah, no, I think we really need to leverage our partners within the workforce development ecosystem.
the system, especially our physical locations that I mentioned. Okay. Um, I don't know if Danielle and Anna have anything that you'd like to add, but I think a lot of this will evolve as we build out the portal, but we very much understand the need to have kind of a curriculum that goes all hand in hand with this higher Charlotte. Now, now this is Malcolm Graham thinking out loud, right? So, which is, can be dangerous from time to time. But I look at our quarters of opportunity and, and these are quarters that we've significantly, we've identified um, uh, in a perfect world, we would have a community resource center on every quarter taking um, a consideration of why opportunities, housing opportunities, employment opportunities, um, job skills opportunities, just where they can go to get help, right? Uh, where they can actually physically talk to someone about their qualifications or their lack thereof based on circumstances. So how do we encourage that that face-to-face -face meeting where people don't believe that their resume have gone into a, a portal and never to be heard from again? So let me just jump in on it because it does relate exactly to quarters of opportunity and we have talked quite a bit about how do you take it to physical locations and I don't know that it's a standing one in every corridor, right? Every corridor is different. What are the opportunities in the corridors to bring that resource and not just jobs, right? But it's a lot of resources. Um, we've talked in one quarter, how could we partner with the nonprofit? If they have an if they have a um, exposure in a corridor already, they have a physical location. Another quarter, we've talked about how could we partner with the Y to do that. So it is definitely something that or we're church. thinking about. Or church, right? right? We've even talked also about pop up locations, right? So how do you get creative on kind of understanding the community in that particular corridor or communities, right? Um, and getting to strategies with those, and that's more been in the work and will come through as higher develops. The portal and some of this other work that'll come through the work that we do in, in corridors. These two overlap quite a bit. Okay. Anything to add to it? Yes? No? I'll keep it here. Okay. All right. I'll open it up to the committee for questions. I think Councilmember Wallington uh, is first on deck. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you alluded to a couple of things that I wanted to bring up because as I'm listening, I definitely can appreciate the. Uh, um, the thought behind the portal, what I'm a little concerned about at this point is I, I see exactly how it's very employer first. And my concern is that as we think about the root causes of the problems that we're trying to solve, how do we impact the metrics that you have, for instance, on the last slide, just basic income, basic percent unemployment. It really feels like there's an opportunity to do something a lot more tactical. I hope that we don't spend the next 16, 17 months building a website because I think that the sense of urgency in getting folks back to work and upskilling folks across the community uh, would dictate more tactical efforts. And maybe to your uh, previous comment, Tracy, we'll see that in our corridors of opportunity updates. But I, I just don't want us to spend so much time thinking about how to put together a database or infrastructure in that way that we miss the tactical people need to go to work. Um, I would also agree with some of the comments around the digital divide. Uh, when I think about people who are looking for employment or who would like to upskill or are in need just simply because of the rising cost of living in our city to uh, increase their income, how do we make sure that what we're doing right now today is going to deliver that for them today versus a conceptual collaborative and all the other buzzwords type strategy that ultimately the people on the ground are not going to see for quite some time. So for me, I appreciate the work of the portal um, or the, the work you all are doing towards the portal. However, I, that for me is, is um, an aside to the issue at hand. I know we've spent a bit of time on Higher Charlotte already. And like I say, with the timing, um, I would like to see some 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 real results within the next 16, 17 months beyond uh, putting together a portal. Um, when I think about um, just tactically how we how we market to, I saw some uh, notes on the presentation in regards to putting marketing and connecting people at existing workforce development provider locations. Those are really the people who kind of already know what's going on. That's how they got to the Goodwills. That's how they got to the NC Works and different places. Um, I'd like to see us get a little more gorilla in our marketing beyond even the churches and the YMCA. 
the folks that are going to those places oftentimes are already to some degree connected. How are we reaching the people that are at the corner of Western Remount or at the corner of Arrowwood and Nations Fort Road? Those are the places that we need to really be leaning in on. How do we partner? And we maybe we are certainly open to here. I hope we are already partnering with um, like people's PO offices and different things to where our reentering citizens are already on a, a pathway when they come out. That's a level of, of innovation and the level of tactical results that I'm hoping that we can get to far beyond and before we see a portal. Uh, so for me, I'd like I just I'd like to see a little bit more um, of the boots on the ground work show up here or certainly would like to be um, made aware of how that work is going. Uh, very good comments, very good point, uh, and I, I tend to agree uh, with those. And it goes back to this hypothetical community resource center and it can where folks can go uh, and get a wide variety of city services or yep. city information. Um, and these are literally those folks that we're really trying to, uh, in some cases, pull uh, to the service. Obviously, we can't make folks get a job or make folks um, um, do what they don't want to do, but we certainly can provide an environment where the information is readily available. Right. And, and, we, and we absolutely hear you. The, the intent behind, let's go back to the beginning of the intent behind hire. I got it. It was to end up not having five different portals. The city has a portal, the county has a portal, the CELC is building another portal. It was really to how do we convene everybody so that we can be united in the resources that are out there. Um, and so that's, that's been the major purpose of it. No different than quarters of opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. The city isn't the entity that's out there solving everything with corridors. It takes a, a lot of work from a lot of other organizations. And so how do we unite together in the work that we individually or each organization does to make sure that we're delivering the right level of services? And Councilmember Watlington, I was glad to hear you say Western Remount because obviously we just purchased a building there, two buildings. So, you know, that, that is something that we think about when we think about quarters of opportunity or how are we delivering those services. But hire has really helped us get concentrated on what are the things that we need to do. Um, and we recognize that a portal, um, a digital portal, as well as offering opportunity out in our community is just as important. Yeah, I, 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 I agree there too as well, right? But it's just this balance of the two. And I think what I'm saying and uh, and I don't want to speak for Ms. Wallace, but I think we're saying the same thing too, is that there are people on the ground that need help immediately, right? And so part of our, and, and it, it could be um, for a job, it can be for down payment assistance for affordable housing, it can be I live in this corridor and I want to rehab my home. It could be a wide variety of things that the city is offering um, that we can have those information in their communities, whether it's the the building we bought, or this community resource center uh, um, on Bates Fort Road, or at Eastland Mall, uh, there's another site, quote unquote, right, um, that a church is offering to host. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we're understand the mission, yeah. um, but we want to make sure that the, the mission uh, is able to accommodate people where they are. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, Mr. Drake's floor is yours, sir. So uh, I've actually said for some time that I think we should invest more in jobs. Uh, I think if we enable somebody to pay their own rent, that's a preferable outcome to uh, subsidizing rent. So uh, I, I feel that there's a we, we can strike a better balance between our housing subsidies and our job creation. And therefore, I'm all in favor of investment. And I also want to say I strongly agree with what uh, you have said, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I think you can look at this on two levels. And one of them is trying to improve the efficiency of the operation of our job market in order to connect people with opportunities uh, to facilitate information. But the other level is the one where we try to bring up people who have been maybe excluded or who are operating at the lowest levels uh, and, and I don't think they are going to get the maximum benefit from a portal because they will probably have difficulty, frankly, interpreting what the portal might mean for them. 
So I'm also strongly in favor, my idea was something like a city-operated Office of Employment Opportunity, uh, but I think that's in the same vein as what has just been suggested. Uh, I believe we have to have an in-person access point, and it's got to be a, an easy one, uh, and we have to then find ways to encourage people uh, to, to have hope and to think that something good could come of uh, outreach on their part. And uh, the difficulty with a portal is uh, you get there, you're sitting in front of your screen, and it's just impersonal. Uh, I mean, you can put that data in, and a computer will tell you what information it has stored in it. But I think a personal consultation is critical. A lot of job seekers have the experience of sending out resumes and having them all go straight into the waste paper basket. So one of the things the city can do is talk to people, uh, get them ready to apply for jobs with the skills program we've talked about, but then also kind of tell their story or get their message through to uh, personnel, uh, HR departments, so that their applications for jobs get taken more seriously. So I'm, I'm in the same mode of, of wanting to see something that's more immediate, more personal, and, and more attuned to the specific needs of people who are really don't even know where to start, frankly. Uh, and again, having been on the board of Goodwill for nine years now, uh, I, I see a lot of that and the, the kind of outreach efforts that are necessary to, to bring people in who don't actually have much hope and may not be doing anything about creating a future for themselves because they're just uh, skeptical. Uh, I will also mention that uh, I, I have talked a number of times about the potential for apprenticeships and uh, Christina, Tracy, you'll recognize this, but I, I really think the apprenticeship model where people have employment, they pursue a certain path, they get a certification in a certain skill, um, and those can be high paying. Tylers make $80,000 a year. Uh, that, among other things, means that we have to kind of get away from a model in which some people think that if they don't go to college, they have somehow failed. A lot of people go to college and come out with nowhere to go, uh, no employment prospects, and they really aren't suitable candidates for a college education. Uh, many go to college and don't even finish. So to try and create an appealing path uh, after high school that leads to a professional certification and a stable income uh, strikes me as being a better result than having somebody go to college, maybe incur debt uh, in the mistaken belief that they have some guarantee of employment when they're done. So uh, all in favor of this, appreciate the, the work. I, I would just supplement the portal with in-person kind of delivery capabilities. Thank you. Thank you, um, Council Member Drakes. Uh, any additional well, questions? Yes, I have I have a comment, Mr. Chairman. Floor is yours. Uh, thank you. I agree with the, some of the comments made by my colleague, Mr. Drakes, here, that I agree with the portal here, but we do need to address this issue in short run, that is uh, in-person counseling, mentoring, but then also job fairs and career fairs where how can city participate in jobs fair and career fair with other institutions uh, where we have on, on the spot resume building workshops, uh, how to prepare for an interview, uh, how to successfully pass an interview. I think some of this skill set are so critical uh, for landing a, landing a good paying job. So I, I would like us to really build our efforts around uh, professional development um, and uh, fill that gap here. Uh, because a lot of job seekers, to Mr. Drake's point, they do apply online and they see, they most do never hear a response. And that's where the networking comes in play. That's where uh, mentoring and how do you uh, have a solid resume that helps you get a good paying job. How do you pass an interview? I think some of this are just life skills that are very critical to have a successful professional career. And uh, I would like to see us uh, working with other agencies, not doubling up on our efforts here, but working with other agencies to just roll out this program citywide. Um, 
to really address this issue in the short run while we continue to work on uh, portal. Thank you. Uh, uh, Thank you, Council Member Ashmere. Um, any questions further from the committee members? Council Member Wallington? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I see, if I'm looking properly, I think I see Ms. Anna London, Ms. Danielle Frazier from uh, Charlotte Works, and I know that you're probably knocking on their door in regards to some of the things that we're saying. If it's permissible, certainly, uh, at your pleasure, I'd love to hear if they could respond to anything that we've said today in terms of the work that may be along those lines and how that how that works in partnership with what we've seen today. I think that's very appropriate if they're willing to make comments. And if they can come to the mic so we can record it for the record and introduce themselves and the organization that they represent. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and the rest of the city council members. Danielle Frazier with Charlotte Works. And good afternoon, Anna London with Charlotte Works. So I'll, I'll tee it up and then I'll, I'll hand it over to Anna to share a little bit more um, to uh, what uh, many of you have already shared. This, uh, the Workforce Providers Council uh, portal was really just an initial portal to really help job seekers and businesses navigate our, our system right up front, the immediate need, right? This is going to be a very simple portal that will help individuals to know, fill out a few questions. This is, we're trying to create the, the best first door approach um, because many, again, of our job seekers don't know what services are out here and what are provided. We've also also done a lot of work and continue to do work with grassroots organizations because we also know sometimes NC Works is the best kept secret and many individuals don't really know where our services are and how to access them. We've put uh, individuals and placed career advisors in very specific locations over the years in the community. Um, we had one at the, the Mecklenburg County Detention Center. We have one at the um, Community Resource Center with the county, uh, as well as working with other, again, grassroots organizations. Because we do know that many people know of those services, right? So working with community leaders, with church leaders, with others that are literally in the communities, but also trust those partners. We also know it's a trust factor, right? So we want to make sure that we get into the community so that individuals will trust us to be able to provide the services that they need. So I'll let Anna add anything additional. Yeah. The only other thing that I would add is that we have had um, a couple of preliminary conversations about what could it look like to really partner with the corridor's work. Is there an opportunity for us to really align career advising? So um, very similar to what you all have said, um, you know, could we identify career advisors, one, two, whatever that looks like, to really align efforts in those corridors um, of opportunity? So having having someone to go out into the corridors to do the, um, you know, the in-person physical work rather than referring everyone to a portal. So what could it look like to have a career advisor to do workshops, to do resumes, um, to connect people with um with training, training scholarships and supportive services that really do lead to an industry recognized credential and then also jobs that are in that community um, or at least you know where they could have access to employment. So we would love to you know continue the conversation to see how can we bring more of the, the human development work, um, physical human development work to this work. We know the portal is going to be great. We are also launching the WPC portal as Danielle mentioned because we know that job seekers need access today not a year from now, three years from now. So we would love to continue that conversation, but just know um, that there is opportunity to connect some of this work um, to the public workforce um, system, which is the NC Works Career Centers here in the city in Mecklenburg County. Can I add one, one last thing? The one thing that I'll add is that the Workforce Providers Council is also very, very intentional on mm -hmm. focusing on the talent, the wraparound supports, yeah. the services. And so that's the other piece of the work that we've done over the years, too, is to really identify individuals. What are the profiles? What are their needs? What is their job seeker journey? And we'd love to kind of know we've mentioned it in some other uh, mm -hmm. meetings, but just to provide updates on that and how we're actually using that information to help our job seeker, seekers navigate our ecosystem based on their very specific journey. So if I can summarize, I think what I'm hearing the committee say, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that we are uh, all supportive uh, and very encouraged uh, by the portal system, um, that we, we believe that it has a major um, uh, asset to trying to consolidate how we identify and work with a, a wide variety of employers. So go forward with that, keep working on it, but at the same time, Bring, bring us something back that really address grassroots issues in terms of how do we get boots on the ground, how do we get um, uh, this type of information 
on our corridors of opportunities? How, how do we really focus on helping people help themselves, right? And, and making the information user friendly and available uh, uh, to folks related to job fairs, career fairs, professional development, networking. Um, and even, you know, it can be a cross-trained thing too, right? If, if the city hypothetically, right, um, had a, a, a facility where not only could they get this type of information, but they can get a wide variety of other basic information uh, that uh, appeals to people in that particular segment of the city. Uh, down payment assistance, uh, credit counseling. Um, um, I want to live um, in this community and I want to um, rehab my house. Um, the code enforcement issues. I mean, those basic type of nitty gritty grassroots issues that a lot of our constituents are calling and emailing and asking about how do they, how they, how do they be a part of the growing city? How do they access the information? How, how can they talk to someone? Um, I, I'm telling my age now. When I was used to be able to walk into a HR office. Um, I sometimes I sold myself, right? Um, the, the resume was blank at that time, but they saw Malcolm and they saw my story uh, and they saw my commitment and someone took a chance on me, right? No one would do that through a portal. And I think that's what we're, we're, we're trying to articulate. Um, but I think, we're, I think we're all on the same page. Did I do a good job doing that? Okay. Mr. Phipps, uh, we don't see your hand, um, at least I don't. <laughs> You're not gone yet, Mr. Oh. Phipps. <laughs> You're still yes, working. I took it down. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, don't know I lost the uh, feed. But what I'm interested in knowing, is this portal, portal I mean, it seems like it's, it's, it's uh, we're, we're asking for uh, an expanded, a more expanded version. I mean, was the purpose of this portal strictly for for job and career enhancement, or is it for basically to include a whole myriad of, of things that the chair just mentioned? I, I I'll I'll answer that. I'll have Tracy. I think it's just for the jobs for sure, right? Connectivity to jobs. I wanted Austin to answer. So yeah, he's building it. <laughs> yeah, Austin, go ahead. I can add to that, and I'm just so appreciative of of where you all have went with with the feedback because it's really what catalyzed our vision for the portal from day one is is how do we sort of reverse that narrative of, of Charlotte on 50 out of 50 of mobility. And what we thought about initially is what would it look like to understand data, not just about the jobs, but about who needs opportunity and where. And so that's something we've been working on with folks at Leading on Opportunity who are trying to understand how do we look across all these partners who are sort of touch points, whether it's Urban League or Goodwill or NC Works, and start to, to better map and, and sort of coordinate everyone who has that, that human interaction with, with the folks who are looking for opportunity. And so I think what, what you all hit on really well is that we don't need a technology with, without the human part. And we definitely, the last thing we want to do is create a technology that, that it's trying to replace the human element. Um, and so love the vision for opportunity resource centers and the portal being something that provides the necessary infrastructure for folks to be able to say, here's the range of training and employment opportunities that could work for you based on what you and your family needs today. Here's the other resources that we can connect you with. Uh, and I think that's something that we've seen Charlotte Works and Hire Charlotte really working diligently to figure out with, with the grassroots partners and community organizations. And so we're not necessarily the, the one to to lead all of that work, but can pr provide the infrastructure to support it and think about how the technology um, doesn't just post these jobs into the ether, but also looks at how we can better sort of map and chart out data systems on where the people are who need jobs, what they've been connected with so far, and, and hopefully create a, a more future ready infrastructure that is, is designed with that, that human in mind first. So I'll, I'll just say that it's totally in line with what we're building towards. And I think we're trying to go one step at a time and make sure that we can source those opportunities and then make sure that they're they're put in front of the folks who need them the most. So thank you all. A great response, right. great answer, right, right in line in terms of what I think the conversation has been centered around today. Okay. Right. 
Now, I know that uh, you said that you're going to be talking to the county. Now, do we know that this portal will be accessible through libraries as well? Uh, I We got bits and pieces of that, Council Member Phipps. Could you restate your question? Yeah, I was wondering uh, to the extent that, that uh, a discussion will be held with the county about this, this portal uh, uh, effort. Will that be access to the portal available in, in, in the various libraries throughout mm. Charlotte Mecklenburg? We've formed a, a monthly working group that consists of, of the county, Charlotte Works, um, CLC, and a couple of other partners who are helping advise us on how to roll this out and get it in front of the right folks. And so the county's been really on board with the idea of, of creating this to help improve their employment services and ability to reach people where they're at. So we haven't yet said exactly where it's going to exist, but I think they're really trying to, to get ahead of us on this, on understanding how they can mobilize it on day one and get it in front of as many folks as they can and and have people there to help help folks navigate it as well. So it's not just sort of an empty screen that no one knows what to do with. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions before we close this out? That's Mr. The Chair, uh, it said, I, I just wanted to comment since we are talking about a significant investment, I would be interested to know uh, to what extent what we're doing has actually been done anywhere else or what best practices are uh, and, and, and to get a sense of, uh, you know, what has worked. And so I just hope it's not a question for now, but I, I hope we can put this in the context of uh, success and of the experience of other cities. Thank you. Uh, point, point well taken and I think noted. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Great, moving on to our last agenda item, and thanks for all that discussion around um, Higher Charlotte update. Um, we wanted to provide you a first round ARPA uh, funding update and where we stood with the initiatives that were approved under kind of what I'll call the economic development bucket. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Christina for the first, first ones. Great, thanks Tracy. So we covered the higher ARPA funding, and so as you recall, we, we dedicated about $16 million to workforce and development and small business support for the first round, and look forward to giving you an update for the balance of all the progress we made um, since we were awarded the funding. Next slide, please. So we were awarded a million funding toward Open for Business, and this is our enhanced digital platform that's really our outward facing one-stop shop economic development website and we've launched um, what we call a minimal viable product which has great features and helpful information for users that we want to continue to build on and I just wanted to share what the pillars of of this site are they include meet Charlotte which is for business recruitment so this is really for companies that might not be as familiar with Charlotte and has a bunch of information about how, you know, why Charlotte, our incentive opportunities, all the demographic information that will help companies make a decision that Charlotte needs to be on their radar. Um, Grow Charlotte, which is really geared towards small businesses and entrepreneurs. You might be familiar with our Charlotte Business Resources website, and that will be migrated over to Open for Business really under the grow pillar. We also will be migrating the early bird component of that soon as well. And then we've got Invest Charlotte, which is really um, the broadest sense of the definition of invest. So everything from public-private partnerships to redevelopment and development opportunities to investing in your careers. This will have all of our workforce development initiatives as well. So we're still building out that story, um, adding some content, some additional features. We'll have a central blog feature where we'll, where we'll have lots of news updates for everybody. And this is really our external facing economic development um, that really unifies all of our efforts beyond the city website. And um, we've spent about 150000 to date. And as we get the site exactly where we want it, then we'll be investing more in some paid media opportunities to really generate awareness of the site, especially to some of our out-of-market target markets for business recruitment. And if you remember, Open for Business was born out of uh, COVID, 
where as we had this task force that said, how are we reaching the small businesses? How is everybody, how are the resources that are out there in the community being, being found? And so it's grown from that um, into something that is bigger, trying to live under those three pillars. Right. Next slide, please. In terms of small business support, we're very excited to share. We just announced that we've awarded $2.5 million um, in 11 grants and the selected organizations are on the screen right there and they're beginning the work in August and they're will be completing their investments by the end of the year so we're really excited about that opportunity and that's really t the goal is to serve our local small business community here next slide please small business innovation grant program so we're partnering with Charlotte Center City Partners again um, similar to what we did during CARE. So it's looking at similar eligible costs such as marketing, capital improvements, technologies. We'll be devoting $2.5 million to this program. And um, the average grants will range between twenty and 40000 We expect round one to hit this fall, and then we'll do another round in early 2023. So Next. Could, yeah. could you go back to that again? Help me understand that again, Two point five to Charlotte Center City Partners to distribute to? Yeah, so <laughs> Councilmember Graham um, and the committee members, this uh, program was one that we did with CARES Act funding. Uh, okay. I think we did a million five. It actually started a program that um, was led with Honeywell um, and Center City Partners, and we served on the um, selection committee. And so we actually funded a round, mm -hmm. and we did it citywide, not within the Center City Partners footprint. So this is actually doing the exact same thing. Okay. Um, the 2.5 million, yes, that will, funding will go to Center City Partners, and they will actually issue those awards. We'll be part of the process um, at every step. We have been to date. Uh, what we wanted to make sure that we did um, is that we did some research to really truly understand what our small businesses needed to make sure that the program aligned with that. Um, and what we're hearing from them is it actually does. The, the, the program that we did with CARES money is very similar um, is what, what is needed, but it's really interesting what we're hearing is, is that we funded these um, different things to help the businesses pivot their operations so that they could stabilize and grow in COVID. And they actually now, because of things like, um, uh, it costs so much money to hire somebody now. You know, they train them, and then they actually may not even show up to work. You know what I'm saying? The following week, like, they're, they're struggling, so all their money is going towards that. So they're like, we really want these pivots that you help fund to become permanent. So pivot um, from pivot to permanency, that's why that's there. And so, yes, we've got the, we anticipate the grants will be between twenty dollars and $40,000, but um, this will be a citywide program again. Okay. And small business also takes into consideration minority-owned firms for sure. Yes. And do we calculate um, the the difference between awardees to small business versus MWBs? So um, my understanding, I know with CARES, and my understanding is the same thing with ARPA, is that you cannot prioritize with federal funds, meaning that we can't say that. But you can track. Correct. That's what I was going to say. But we do track everything okay. to make okay. sure that, you know, the reason why we're doing two rounds, honestly, is I want to be able to say round one, what does it look like? Did we hit the corridors correctly? Did we Do we have enough diversity? You know what I'm saying? Are we getting the response rates that we want so that then when we do a second round, we can make any adjustments that are gotcha. needed? Okay, I'm good. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Thanks, Holly. Next slide, please. And then in terms of workforce I, partners. Can, oh. Can we go back to the last slide? I started something, I'm sorry. Yeah, so. <laughs> Is this similar to Innovation Grant? It is. It's the same program from last time. Okay, so are we prioritizing businesses that did not get funding in first two rounds? Um, you, we will, yes, that is correct. I mean, there's, this isn't, these grants are, there are not as many of them, you know what I'm saying? They're bigger and there's not as many. So yes, we will be looking at, um, at businesses that did not receive them the first time around. Okay, thank you. Because I know that several businesses had applied and some of them did get funding because this is very competitive and it is. which, you know, where you can really focus on innovation 
versus just the day-to-day -day operations. So where the funding is very limited for this kind of opportunities, I just want to make sure that we are, we are uh, assisting as many businesses as possible. We will absolutely prioritize that. And thank you for saying that, because you are correct. This is not for operations. This is not for hiring right. people. This is not for inventory, those type of things. It actually is for those innovations that can happen within the company. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And we're going to be giving $1.5 million in workforce partner support grants. And we just uh, closed nomination submit submittals on Friday. We received 18 submissions. Um, what's really cool about this round that we're doing is we've had we've asked the nonprofits who submitted an application to partner with a smaller nonprofit to um, make up 10% of what they're proposing. So this makes it a lot more inclusive. We're excited to just be able to reach more nonprofits in the community to come up with some meaningful work here. And this is focused on hard skills training within our target industries. And so the grants will be awarded in September 2022 and they have until September 2024 to, to use the funds. And, and this goes right in line with what we were talking about with Hire Charlotte, right? An immediate need now. What are people doing? How do we partner with people who are boots on the ground um, to do that immediate work now? Correct. And this has also helped us expand our successful renew program. So we've added cohorts with Goodwill. Um, 19 people are participating with that. And then Urban League. Their cohort five will be starting in August with 20 participants. Next slide, please. And then this is just a quick update on the other ARPA commitments that we made for the first round. So we have um, allotted four million to CRVA for marketing support, and this is really focusing on driving leisure demand, knowing that this is a critical catalyst in leading overall recovery. So um, this is really going to be helping them market Charlotte to support weekend hotel demand, maintain and improve Charlotte's image, especially around their pillars that they've promoted for Charlotte, including culinary, arts and culture, outdoor recreation and diversity and inclusion, and supporting the hospitality businesses through effective campaigns, promotions, and media efforts that drive visitor experiences. Another um, important thing to note about this investment is that this is gonna enable the CRVA to enhance their presence in target markets. So typically they were really focusing their marketing efforts around a 300 mile radius, but now this will help them expand to 400 miles. So we can really get the word out and help and drive uh, more travel and tourism to Charlotte with these dollars. And then quarters of opportunity. I know we spoke a lot about this during our hire presentation and we have a lot of 3 million to really implement some of those EY labor study recommendations that we really want to integrate with hire. And I think a lot of the dialogue we had earlier in this conversation will help keep us informed as we build out this plan, which is a priority for the next two quarters. So. Okay. Any questions from members? Yes, I have a question on workforce partner support program. Could you uh, send us a list of who were approved and who applied and who did not get approved? Yes, um, we just received all the applicants on Friday. So our selection committee is going to be reviewing those in August and we'll be making a decision this month. So we will be sure to send you all of that information once available. Great, thank you. I think that's it. Unless there's any questions from committee members, um, we want to thank uh, Councilwoman-elect Marjorie Malona for being with us virtually. She's she's listening to us, and she would like to have copies of the handouts, if you can send to her. So welcome aboard. Um, look forward to working with you. Any other questions? If not, uh, meeting is adjourned.